G'day legends, I hope that you are having a fantastic day and a fantastic end to the week. It's almost Friday, we're almost there. So we have a fair bit to go over today, so if this video does run long, I do apologise. Now of course we're going to look at the maps, we're going to talk about the SBU, we're going to look at the money and the aid that's been blocked by the US that was being held up in the Senate that may not go through. We're not really sure. We're going to talk more on this, but so far the, vo the voting has blocked that aid going forward. And also with that aid being blocked, there's actually been a massive military aid request made from Ukraine as well. And that is the first thing we're going to go over. And then we're going to talk about casualties and a few things there. And of course, Ministry of Defense updates a little bit of everything. So this came out from Reuters. And we're just going to go across the article. So Ukraine's latest weapon requests includes the third air defense and F-18s. That uh, the December 7th, Ukraine's latest list of US weapons said they need to fight the Russian military, includes sophisticated air defense systems, F-18 Hornet fighter jets, drones, Apache Black Hawk helicopters, um, according to documents seen by Reuters. Now, of course, Apache are uh, attack helicopters, Black Hawks, utility transport, very, very famous choppers in this. Officials from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense presented a list of armaments to meet the needs of defense forces of Ukraine during a closed-door session at a conference in Washington on Wednesday. Now, this is going to come with very similar issues that we saw and still are seeing with the F-16. Apache, Black Hawk, we know Ukraine operate at least one uh, Black Hawk for uh, security services, but not widespread. Incredibly long time to train, equip for Apache, Black Hawk helicopters. A very long, you know, very similar to fighter aircraft. So that's going to take well over a year, and it's just being thrown on the table. It could be years and years to actually build that in. A lot of people, and I speculated on this very early on when Ukraine was really asking for the F-16 for fighter aircraft, could something like an attack helicopter actually be better for that ground support of troops on the ground for this? And of course, we saw the F-16 route go through. But in this as well, requesting the F-18 Hornet fighters. As we know, Australia's moved across F-35 and Super Hornet Growler, and a lot of countries are getting rid of traditional Hornets. So there may be Hornets actually up for grabs, and many have speculated the Hornet was a better platform for Ukraine. I'm going to throw a spanner in the works here and a dirty rumour that I heard too, but off a fairly uh, a, a good source. So you're going to have to bear with me on that, but it's not verified information about these Hornets. So the Hornets could have been a better option. Dual engine, Hornets can be carrier-based, so they're a lot, long, a lot stronger landing gear underneath. Now, what I have heard, and this is from a fairly reliable source, but again, this is unconfirmed speculation just at this point, was that certain contractors had actually pushed on the Ministry of Defence to get the F-16 because if they got F-16s, then they would have to build new runways or repair runways for them, therefore for um, more contracting work there where the F-18s could have used used existing runways. And this person sent me a rundown of that and the corruption involved in that. And I thought that was very interesting. Again, that is just pure speculation at this point because I haven't had it verified through any official uh, sources. But we know there's hornets around Canada, Australia, and could be a very deadly weapon for Ukraine. Are F-18s, F-16s going to turn tides of war? No, but it's going to be another tool in the tool bag. This continues. The comprehensive list included weapons Ukraine already has in stock, like the Abrams 155mm shells and weaponry such as the F-16 drones, Attackums, whatever. Now, a few, uh, the but, the list has a few surprises, including big ticket items like a C-17 Globemaster transport jets made by Boeing and C-130 Super Hercules made by Lockheed Martin. Boeing's atta Apache attack helicopters made the list, which were spoken about as well. Now, C-17, C-130, big, slow, big target transport aircraft like those. Again, it's going to take a hell of a long time, the build-up, the training, all of this. All the equipment being transported by C-17s, C-130s, these is going into somewhere like Poland, like Romania, and then crossing into Ukraine from there. Actually flying those aircraft in contested airspace, Probably not going to happen, but it is interesting just to look over what actually in this list was 
requested here too. Documents show Ukraine is seeking F-18 Hornet fighter jets, three types of drone made by General Atomics, like the MQ-9B Sky Guardian and the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense THAAD air defense system made by Lockheed. So this is a pretty big wish list. And I guess as it's coming into Christmas, my wish list looks very much the same. I would like a C-17 and an Apache as well if I can. But these come with all the same issues. Realistically, more artillery, more of a, like already equipment in for the tanks, for whatever systems is going to be better than taking more people out, training them for years like it is going to take on the F-16. And mid next year, we may actually see those F-16s in use in Ukraine. And we'll see how it actually goes. Now, I copped a little bit of flack over something I didn't miss on purpose. People saying I didn't report it on purpose. No, I'm not afraid to talk about whatever, uh, but I did miss this, and this is going to be talking about casualties. And we do know I'm not a fan of casualty numbers. One, I think, you know, every number in this is someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's brother, someone's husband, someone's wife. It is horrible seeing how large these numbers are, but I also talk about how these can be used absolutely for misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda as well, that I just don't believe these numbers. And I don't believe them not only from that aspect, but the aspect of how do you actually get these numbers with long-range systems. But the MOD, this is what people had to go at me for, was not talking about this. So we're going to talk about it because I missed it accidentally. Between the 24th of February 22 and November 23, that's the span of war so far, official Russian Ministry of Defence forces likely suffered between 180,000 and 240,000 personnel wounded and approximately 50,000 killed. Wagner Group mercenaries likely suffered approximately 40,000 wounded and 20,000 killed. Therefore, overall, the Russian side has likely suffered around 220 to 280,000 wounded and approximately 70,000 killed. This gives an estimated range of between 290,000 to 350,000 total Russian combat casualties. The median of this estimate range is 320,000 total Russian combatant casualties. Even amongst Russian officials, there is likely a low level of understanding about the total casualty figures because of a long-established culture of dishonest reporting within the military and the use of mobile crematoriums. We don't know actually how paperwork work and reporting is actually being done there as well, but these are significantly lower than other numbers we'll talk about. So this is from today from uh, the Ministry of Defence of Ukraine that they're talking eliminated personnel. So this is... This is killed at 335,000 and apparently today added 1,270 here along with then the armoured vehicles and tanks, all of this in here too. So these numbers, with when Oryx was doing his thing, these were very easy to confirm and these were higher and the personnel is what we're talking about. So of course, talking a lot lower than over here. But at the end of the day, after this war, we'll probably still get a range, but it will be interested in, but at the moment... At the moment, I do believe it is a lot lower than this figure here, but still massive, massive amounts of human loss in this. I believe this figure is probably more close to your over war, over, um, overall wounded and killed number. I think a lot of people with agree will agree on that. Ukrainian numbers, look, we just don't have any idea. You'll hear wild numbers thrown around, but we don't have any idea. But we do know that it will be high, especially after going on the offensive this year and just the amount of attacks that have been going on for now well, well almost two years. Now, the big news of the day, and we get to the big news, what, to eight? and a half minutes into the video, but the US Senate today has blocked a supplemental funding bill that included financial aid for Ukraine, and this absolutely increases the likelihood that Congress will fail to approve more funding for Ukraine before the end of the year. We know this is desperate. Now, in this funding bill, it was Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and some border security as well thrown in the mix of it. So that whole thing got put down. It wasn't just Ukraine. So, of course, this can be taken back to the table, redrawn up, negotiated, and changed in there. But the vote was 49 in favour and 51 against, as every uh, Republican senator opposed advancing the legislation. 60 votes are needed to make up the bill. So, the most was 
51 against, 49 in favour. They need 60 to push it forward. So they'll go back, negotiate, but unsure if it will go before they go on leave over the Christmas period. Now, before the vote, the Biden administration, of course, who's in the White House, has warned that Ukraine is desperate for military aid, saying if Putin takes Ukraine, he won't stop there. We'll have something that we don't seek and that we don't have today. American troops fighting Russian troops. We can't let Putin win. Now, will Putin stop there? Now, one, I don't believe that the Russian military, as it stands now, has the power to fully occupy Ukraine. And will it stop there? Well, then it's on that hard stop of NATO, and that is the hard stop. So I don't believe we'll see it push through there, but we could see other front lines open in other areas. And we're going to talk a little bit about Russia's influence in some other or areas operation a little bit later on in the video and where they may be pushing not only militarily but it's all of course linked in now on tuesday night zelensky was scheduled to speak at the senate briefing but he was forced to cancel due to a last minute issue now i am unsure currently what could be more pressing and more important than this now especially now knowing the outcome of that vote now Earlier that night, Zelensky's chief of staff, Andrew Yamak, expressed how there's a big risk of a Ukrainian defeat in this war without continued US support. After cancelling on Tuesday, on Wednesday, Zelensky then met with G7 leaders at a short notice meeting, saying, Russia believes America and Europe will show weakness and will not maintain support for Ukraine at the proper level. Putin believes the free world will not fully enforce its own sanctions and the Russian elite mocks the world's doubts about using Russian assets to compensate for damage from Russian aggression. Russia hopes only for one thing, that next year the free world's consolidation will collapse. Now, that said in this, it's hard to say that that isn't exactly what is happening, that there is less support from the free world, as Zelensky says, from the West, that there isn't more people pulling back from supporting Ukraine. And that's pretty much exactly what we've then seen in the Senate. And we're seeing that throughout the media, especially now that Israel has kicked up. Now, I believe right here and now with this is the most critical moment in this entire war, as funding really hangs in the balance, especially after the failed counteroffensive. And as right now, as we're going to show on the maps, Russia continues making ground. Now, I don't believe at all that this is the end of the funding, but the amount will be negotiated, and I can tell you that it's not going to be negotiated upwards. And I have to feel for these young men on the front line who are giving absolutely their all, the thousands, the tens of thousands that have died, and they're doing the work on the front line, doing everything after them, while old men in suits or in a green track suit discuss politics and what's going on there, and that's going to decide the future. And sadly, Ukraine's future is in the hands of the politicians first and the soldiers second. But the ones who are dying are the soldiers who aren't making the decision. And the White House has warned that most of the $110 billion allocated to Ukraine has already been distributed, that basically that money's running on fumes. And this puts the future of this war in unknown territory we know ukraine is using the equipment basically as soon as they get it and they can't afford a kink in that supply chain the ones are on the back foot it'll be very hard to then plug that gap now as the war slows into winter it may give ukraine some more breathing room uh to wait and see if the u.s will send some more money to send some more weapons but that's going to be difficult too because well russia's currently not giving ukraine any of that relief with their very early winter offensive and making ground in many directions currently. I see many saying Ukraine will prevail with or without US aid. And sadly, this is just not the case. In September, Schumer quoted Zelensky saying, if we don't get the aid, we will lose the war. NATO is heavily reliant, overly reliant on the US. And of course, the NATO support into Ukraine is primarily US. So without like that quote, without the US's support, the war will be lost. Now, where this goes, we are unsure. What is a loss in this war? What is a win in this war? We don't really know, but it will be very interesting coming up into this Christmas period, that Christmas leave in the next few weeks, where this actually goes. 
Putin has made a very rare international one-day trip escorted by fighter aircraft. And we're going to have a look over this here of these Su-35s escorting Putin's aircraft. The Su-35, I tell you one thing, leave technology aside, the Russian Soviets know how to make a beautiful looking fighter jet. Yeah, I know one of these would get eaten by like a F-22, but as far as looks, I think these along with the MiG-29 are the best looking fighter jets ever made. Of course, this is Russian state television releasing this footage. Planes going up and then escorting then Putin's plane. And these were armed. These were not just to show these planes had full armament on board, as you can see then under the wings. And then, of course, fly around in Abu Dhabi. And there is Mr. Putin himself then landing. So that plane made it there, didn't have the fate of Prigozhin's Embraer. Now, I want to actually, before I go over this, I'm getting like ads targeted to me on Instagram. Instagram must think I've got a, a zillion times the money I've got because Embraer, which is the type of private jet that Prigozhin came down on, um, I'm getting like targeted ads towards that because I must have said it in something and I'm like, bro, wrong, wrong audience. But anyway, we've seen Putin has landed in Abu Dhabi and these trips internationally are rare for Putin, but even more rare since the ICC has put a warrant out for Putin's arrest. Now, Saudi and the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, Instagram girls will say Dubai, but no, Abu Dhabi, Dubai sit in the United Arab Emirates, but Saudi and the UAE are not signatories to the ICC founding treaty, so they don't have to arrest Putin anyway. Of course, he wouldn't go there if they did. Now, he visited Saudi Arabia after a short trip to the UAE, capital of Abu Dhabi. Now, once landing, he once landed, sorry, he was escorted to the presidential palace where he was greeted with a 21-gun salute and a flyby of UAE jets with smoke out the back in the colours of the Russian flag. Now, Al Jazeera have said this meeting was part of Russia's quest to stake out a more influential role in the Middle East with oil cooperation and the Israel-Hamas war on the agenda. Putin's Middle East trip is also part of his efforts to demonstrate that the Western attempts to isolate Moscow through sanctions for its war on Ukraine have failed. And that's what we talked about before. We've seen Putin take a very stiff stance on what is happening in Gaza and Israel as well. And of course, trying to have those ties even closer with the Arab states. And tomorrow night on Friday, Putin will host the Iranian president in Russia's capital, Moscow. Then the UAE will welcome Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov on Friday and Saturday. So of course, building more of those bonds and those ties there. Now, this is very interesting out of the last 48 hours too, is Ukrainian media is reporting Ukraine's security service, the SBU, has shot dead in Moscow a former Ukrainian MP after being marked as a traitor. Now, Ilya Kaiva was a pro-Russian member of Ukraine's parliament and fled to Russia a month before the full-scale invasion, frequently criticizing Ukrainian authorities online and being on Russian state media talk shows. And Ukraine's media is confirming this with their anonymous sources, but this was then public. So in a comment to National TV, Ukraine's military intelligence spokesperson, Andrew Yusov, hinted at the country's involvement in the killing. We can confirm that Kiva is done. Such a fate will befall other traitors of Ukraine, as well the henchmen of the Putin regime. Yusol called Kiva one of the biggest scumbags, traitors, and collaborators, and said that his death was justice. Now, also in this, we've seen Oleg Popov, a deputy in the pro-Kremlin Luhansk regional parliament, was killed on Wednesday afternoon in the city of Luhansk, has died then in a car bomb. So let's look over this from uh, Ukrainian media from said to be the SBU. It was a completely legitimate goal because before becoming a deputy, Popov managed many Russian welfare organizations, led illegal armed groups and killed Ukrainians. In addition, the so-called People's Council of the People's Republic of China, this person was the head of the Committee on State Security and Defense, undermining the leader and best advertisement for the effectiveness of the committee's work. So in this somewhat saying confirmed again. And this happening basically the same day does show that Ukraine does have assets inside, well, deep inside Russian territory, as well as they're in their own occupied territory, as we've seen 
a lot of these targeted assassinations before. And Ukraine is seeking to target those that it has deemed have betrayed Ukraine, even outside of their own borders. And we have seen Ukraine promise to hunt those colluding or propagandists or acting in the interests of Russia in their own country or around the world. Before we go on and have a look at some other bits and pieces, let's go over the Ministry of Defence is actually from yesterday of this drone. And we've talked about Russian Shahid, these drones, Iranian drones, a lot. Since mid-23, Russia has almost certainly augmented Iranian-supplied Shahid one-way attack uncrewed aerial vehicles, drones, UAVs, with similar weapons made in facilities in Russia. Russia is now almost certainly attempting to incorporate improvements to the OWA drone designs based on operational experience. In late November 23, a downed UAV was reported as being fitted with a Ukrainian SIM card and 4G modem. This is likely a Russian improvised modification to improve real-time guidance using cell towers to reduce reliance on satellite navigation. There is a realistic possibility that it is also attempting to mitigate Ukrainian electronic warfare measures. So friend maybe looking for Russian SIMs or satellite comms rather than a Ukrainian SIM card. Some other Russian-made drones have likely been painted with black finish, making it harder to visually identify the incoming drones at night. They could put tires on them. Uh, Russia is increasingly employing drones in large raids in an attempt to overwhelm Ukrainian air defences. However, Ukraine continues to successfully neutralise the majority of incoming weapons. These drones are a huge problem. They're going to become more of a problem heading into the winter, and we don't know how the ammunition stores for the air defence actually are heading into winter and on that we don't know how many russia actually has of these drones but we know they're cheap easy to make can be supplied from iran can be made locally so of course these drones now and into the future are going to become more and more of a nightmare on the battlefield as they already are we just know the whole front line is just drones absolutely bloody everywhere that is basically the news of the day let's have a look over these maps as we've got a little bit to go through. We've got a lot. You can see the folders here. I've got some tabs open to try and speed this up. Now, as we talked about last time, Medienka came basically under Russian occupation. So let's have a look at what the MOD update says from the 5th. Over the recent weeks, Russian forces have made creeping advances through the ruins of Medienka, a town in the Donetsk Oblast. Russia now likely controls most of the built-up area. However, Ukrainian forces remain in control of pockets of territory on the western edge of the town. Medienka has been on the front line since 2014 with a pre-war population of 9,000. It is comprehensively ruined. Drone footage suggests that the vast majority of buildings have been reduced to rubble. Russia's renewed efforts against Medienka are part of Russia's autumn offensive, which is prioritizing extending Russia's control over the remaining parts of the Donetsk Oblast, highly likely still one of the Kremlin's core war aims. No shit. So, of course, we have Ukraine the center, the capital of Kiev, the uh, purple areas occupied since 14 and the red since 22 the green areas which ukraine has liberated back or russia has pulled back in so here we have romania poland belarus and russia around here now where we're talking about is Madinka down in here and as we do know that russia made a fair bit of ground pushing up through Madinka. and if we go then onto the sat map if it'll load for us she's been a little bit slow today the old girl maybe it will load maybe it won't here we go. That we can see this is back on the 26th that Russia has made more ground in here and has effectively, you know, put the whole area into grey zone or captured all around up to here. We've seen on other maps that Ukraine just hold on the western edge here. This is simulated by the grey zone here, but Russia has effectively occupied most of the absolute ruins of Madienka. But the purple here, you can see this is just from 2014. So how much real movement have we actually seen on this map over the past couple of days? Realistically, not that much. I'm going to show you the little bits we have seen, and we're going to, of course, then go over Suryak maps. So anywhere west of Robotny, we haven't seen any movements. We thought we may see some movements as Ukraine have made a bridgehead across onto the left bank of the Dnipro, but we haven't seen any movements there for now a number of weeks. So if we come down into Robotny here, we just see in the last couple of days, we do see that Russia made a little bit of ground just on the east here. So we push out, and then we see Russia make just a small bit of ground there. And that is one of really the only ones we actually see here. 
So let's then go day 648. So this is a few days ago. This is pretty much the same-ish area. If we look back on this map, Robotny, and then just here we have uh, situation on Zap Front. Russian army recaptured some positions northwest of Vobove. So, of course, Vobove, northwest, same sort of area. And this is, like we like, put over multiple different maps there. Now, where we are then going to go to next is in this Pevdeni Shumi region here. Of course, this purple, this is held by 2014, as we saw a couple of weeks back. This is where Ukraine first have actually pushed in and held territory into where Russia has held since 14. So pushed back through those uh, positions uh, manned since 14 here. So then let's have a look at this area right in here and see what Suryak is saying. Situation on the Gorlonka front. During the last three days, Russian army recaptured one of the hills previously lost during the attack of the Ukrainian army. So we're looking in here. So we see these three. This is here and have made some ground out here, but this isn't being shown then on the deep state map. Maybe this will update in a couple of days and the deep state is slightly behind in some areas. Now we're going to talk then about Turney. So that was day 649. So three days ago, up to two days ago in Turney here. Situation north east of Donetsk. Russian army continued advancing towards Turney and this taking control over the rest of Shuriki Ravine Gully. So taking a small pocket of ground just in here. Now, if we do line these up, so what we'll look for is these three tree lines. This is these three. We're talking just in this area. Now, let's see if there's any movement on this map. So we can see back in the very start of December, Russia made, Russia made a fair bit of ground there. But in the last couple of days, not too much movement actually being shown in there. Next, we're going to go to Ivanivka here. So Ivanivka, lucky I've got everything set up for you guys just scrolling through different tabs. Uh, situation on the northeastern front, Ukrainian army launched counterattack and recaptured again a series of positions east of in, uh, Ivanivka. So here we have Ivanivka and have recaptured positions in here. Now, this isn't the easiest thing in the world to line up, but if we have a look where Ivanivka is, we see these two sort of funny shaped paddocks that it's in around here. Now, let's have a look and see. And this is being shown on the map comes blue, so that means it's been, the green means old and two weeks, blue means within two weeks, but over the last 24, 48 hours that Ukraine have recaptured those positions. We like when things line up. Now, oh, I should show you where this is. So Ivanivka, we're up in the northeast of the country, and then Terni, we're in the east of the country, just here, and Pevdeni, we're down oh, right in around here. Here. So just give you a little bit of a better idea. Now we're talking in Veseli here. So we're just up in here, down to the south uh, of Seversk. So Veseli, let's see, this is the next one. So this is up to date. So this is day 651. As we know, today is day 652. But situation on the Eastern Front, Russian army restarted, advances around Veseli and took control of high position and a sector of the railway northeast of the village. So this railway, look, let's see where it turns left and then it comes back up to the north. So saying this area just in here, but this isn't showing any movement on this map. Maybe on the next one, we will get an update or we're not really sure. Maybe, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Now, where we're going to go to next is we're going to work our then way up. So we're going to talk about Avdivka. So if we lick, lick pick up, oh my God, lick pick up, I can't talk, from Robitny or a Kiev area here, then we're going to head across Donetsk Oblast, and then we're going to look then at Avdivka in here. Now let's just scroll back a couple of days and see. So we go back to the first. This is where Russia is putting a hell of a lot of effort, a hell of a lot of reinforcements in here to try and squeeze on Avdivka, and you can see just the ground that Russia has made over the past couple of weeks, and Ukraine really trying to push back against that is this is a key area to hold. So we are going to update over the three days up to today where we've just shown you on the map. So Avdivka up in the north. So let's actually show you where this is and then line this up. So we jump onto the satellite map. This is then we're talking about, this is when you hear about the coke plant. This is where we're talking to the northwest up and this is the coke plant in here. As you can see, coke plant. Situation north of Avdivka. Russian army took control over the forest line between the coke plant, where clashes with the Ukrainian army are taking place north of it, and treatment facilities. So have taken 
positions up in here, and this is being shown back on the map. We see this movement around from the second up till today that Russia is moving small little leapfrogs up into that area. Now, on 650, this is now up near Stepove, so same sort of region right here. So we're talking here before, talking here. Situated north of Divka, back and forth battles between Russian army and Ukrainian army continue around Stepove with small advances by both sides. So Ukraine making some positions down here, Russia making some up to Stepove, let's see. So it shows right there. Oh, we see Ukraine make that advancement and the Russia make that little bit there. So both sides having little pushes back and forward there as well. And then let's go to the most recent one from Suryak. Situation in the north of Divka. Russian army increased the attacks towards Coke plant, making minimal gains, but forcing Ukrainian army to retreat from some positions. So pushing down from the north, straight down south into areas of the Coke plant. As we know, any industrial zone like this is going to become an absolute hell of fighting. Where this goes, well, right now it has all the same indications that Bakhmut had this time last year and into the new year as well, as we did see then Bakhmut Oh, so then we're going to push up actually then into Bakhmut, which is the final spot we're going to talk about, where we've spoken about a hell of a lot. Now, let's just have a quick look and see just quickly what has changed here. So we're back in the start of December, and we do see Russia make some ground in the north. They make some in the south, and the last couple of days has been fairly stagnant. So let's look what Surak says from the 6th. Of course, today is the 7th. With the latest Russian advances north of Bakhmut, 85% of the lost positions on May were recaptured. So 85% of what Ukraine made, Russia has made back. Now, for better visualization, the following map shows the maximum advance made by the Russian army and Wagner PMC during the Battle of Bakhmut. Interestingly, to note that the current advance includes areas that were never captured before suggesting that there is an interest in expanding the front line westwards, ending any attempt by Ukraine army to recapture the city of Bakhmut. So, of course, here we're looking up in the north. This is where the the maximum Russian army advance came to, of course, this white line that they've recaptured through these areas because we know Ukraine did push up into here. And that is what we're seeing up in the north as well. So we're going to work through some days. We're going to work in the north. We're going to work in the south. We're going to leave a little bit of everywhere. So 649 in the north of Bakhmut near, here we go, Bodhanivka up here. So a scroll in, we're looking at exactly this sort of area here. So this paddock, this paddock, these are where it lines up. Situation North Bakhmut, Russian army made important advances north of Kromove, forcing Ukrainian army to withdraw towards the trench system adjacent to the road towards Shasovya. Moreover, troops made small advances around the pond north of Bodonivka. So let's scroll back a couple of days and see what they're talking about here. So early December, that is what we saw, but not really that much in here, but we do see some up around Kromova, which I don't believe Suryak actually have on here, but hold out because we may. 651, we're talking up in the north, so two days then later. So Borovnivka, so a little bit further up in this region here. So this is uh, Horovnivka in here, Borovnivka, just in between. If you line up these two paddocks here, these two dark green areas, and this one in this region. Situation north of Bakhmut, Russian army took control over a series of hills southwest of Dubovo and cut the road between Hirohorivka Hiro Hiro and Boronivka. So this doesn't show that similar advancement there, at least to the amount, but I do believe this shows fairly similar of where the front line is. This does say, though, Russia did gain a fair chunk in there. So... And then we're going to move, let's move down into the center of Bakhmut here. Now, what change did we really see? We have seen a fair bit more actually gain there, like they're talking about getting back 85% of those lost positions from the maximum that Russia was in extended in. That situation on Bakhmut front, so we're talking right down in this region right here. So see where this road comes out in here. So, of course, if anyone remembers when we are talking a lot about Bakhmut, this is where the MiG statue is that became a very, like, pinnacle of the, the battle for Bakhmut. You can line up where this green area is that they're talking just in here. The Russian army re-entered the ruins of military units, warehouses at the western outskirts of the city and the grey zone following the recapture of new dashes. So recaptured new positions in here and we do see some of that different areas but showing that there was some positions made there and we do see that the grey zone was then extended there as well. So 
And we're going to talk 649 Bakhmut down in Klishkivka. So just here we see then this is the train line. We know the train line is very important for Ukraine to get that situation south of Bakhmut. So we have Klishkivka would sit just down around here. So this area and this area is what they're then talking about. That Russian army advanced west of Bakhmut and managed to recapture some of the dashes lost during the month of July. In addition, troops advanced north of Klishkivka and reached the defence system located at the western hills of the town. So this area and this area. So let's have a look on the map. So this area, this area. And that's where we like to see the maps somewhat lining up in there. Maybe slightly differences, slight difference on where's geolocated, what's not, but we like to see that. But then we have a more recent one here today as well. So Klishkivka, train line. This is the train line. And then look at this funny-shaped road. So this is said funny-shaped road out of here. So it's saying that Russia has pushed into this area. That Russian army continue advancing north of Klishkivka and took control over a big section of strategic defense system. So in this system right here north of Klishkivka, we know Ukraine had did a hell of a lot of fighting back to get these areas here. Now, legends, let me have a quick little look over, and I believe we've done it. We've done everything. If this one was a bit over the, over the place, I'm sorry. I've had a very, very long day doing everything. But, guys, look after yourselves. Have a fantastic day, and I'll speak to you very soon, probably within the next 24 hours. Right. Look after yourselves. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.